JT, welcome along. Thank you for being our June guest for Talking Trends. Thanks very much, Chantel. It's a pleasure to be here on our fourth birthday. Happy Birthday Fitness Business Podcast. Thank you very much. It is very exciting. It has been a pretty huge month so far and, uh, and I'm really excited to have you on for Talking Trends because I know there is a lot going on out there. But before I do, quick cheers to start the program for today. Cheers. <laughs> I'm glad you got your mug as well. Thank you, JT. I've got okay. water in it though because I don't drink coffee. I yeah, no coffee for you. I've uh, that's right. I'm having enough coffee for both of us, so <laughs> we'll be set. Okay, so let's kick things off with the topic of marketing. So tell us your trends and predictions in the world of marketing in the fitness industry. Well, I've got a few notes. Is that okay? Uh, how how much time have we got? I don't know. You're the boss. <laughs> well, I think one of the obviously the, one of the marketing trends is that we ca cannot avoid is social media, um, and there are a plethora of fitness business consultants across the globe that are telling people to put a hundred percent of their marketing budget into social media. Now, what we're seeing from the report that came out recently from Social Media Examiner is that big companies are actually reducing their, their spend in Facebook and increasing their spend in Instagram. Now, this is because uh, Facebook are losing customers, apparently, who would have thought, and also that the cost is increasing. So I think one of the trends that we're seeing is a growth in that Instagram space for marketing out some of our products uh, and a reduction in Facebook spend. Uh, but my greatest concern is that with clubs spending 100% of their budget, 80% of their budget, possibly even as high as 50% of their budget in social media, what happens if it doesn't work? And, you know, the conversation that I have a lot with club owners is that they are not getting a huge ROI, in other words, leads and therefore sales from spending all their money in social media. Social media, Alan Leach says, is fool's gold. It builds up your brand but does not lead to sales. So it's great branding exercise, but it's not necessarily a great lead generation activity. So what I'm seeing as a trend coming up is returning back to direct mail. Lots of people aren't doing direct mail, so therefore if we start doing direct mail, we're going to stand out from the crowd. But it also enables us to give a really clear message if we segment our market. And again, I think there's a weakness in our marketing is a lot of clubs, a lot of PT studios, a lot of fitness studios are just marketing to everybody and not really being very specific in who they're trying to attract. And the third trend that I'm seeing is that emails are still working as a marketing source when you add value. Now, that's the most critical thing. When you add value, if you don't add value, email marketing is going to fail. Okay, so just talk to us a little bit more about that. When you say when we add value to our email marketing, give us an example of what you're talking about. Okay, it flows on to a trend where I am seeing a really big trend and I reckon it's not working. And that is text messaging. So... As you can imagine, knowing my background and people watching who know anything about me, I've been to a few gyms around the world. One or two. And so what? I'm on a lot of databases. And I can tell you, the only time I ever hear from a gym via text message is when they have a sale on. The only time I get an email from a lot of gyms, not all gyms, but a lot of gyms, is when they've got a sale on. So what that means from a marketing perspective is, as Gary Vaynerchuk says, you're just throwing right hooks at me all the time. You're not adding any value. So let me give you an example of a, of a scenario that a club could look at. Let's imagine that in your community, there's a fun run going on. It could be a marathon, it could be a half marathon, it could be a 5K run. But it's a well-known activity in that community. Why wouldn't a club send out on the Friday before a text message to all of their prospects 
saying, if you're running in the fun run on Sunday, have a great run, good luck, hope you have fun, do your very best. And then on Monday, send a text message out that went something like this. Hope you got a PB in the fun run yesterday. Hope you're not too sore. If next year you want to improve your time, why don't you come down and check out the club? It's a very different type of marketing. But we could do exactly the same type of marketing via email. In fact, in email, we could add in, here are some stretches that you do before the fun run. We could do some, an email on the Monday, which is here are some stretches to reduce your um, doms, your pain, whatever it may be, after the run. And we could even send them uh, how to get uh, 30 seconds faster over 5Ks over the next 12 months, fact sheet. So that's adding value when we understand who our customer is. And I believe this is a trend that we're going to have to move towards because at the moment, all we're doing is throwing right hooks and all we're doing is selling purely based on price and specials. JT, when I'm hearing you talk about this, the thing that's coming to my mind is that having our marketing strategy laid out and thinking about how it is that we're actually talking to our members, to our clients, becomes absolutely instrumental in this process because I think quite often the times that we refer to sending those SMS messages or maybe just shooting out an email is when we suddenly go into panic mode and go, well, we've got to close a sale or we've got to get people to this event. But what you're saying is that really this should all form part of our overall marketing strategy because we're planning in those messages that aren't just necessarily sales messages. They're actually ways to connect with our customers, get them involved in the business. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I believe that in all reality, the days of um, uh, selling 100 memberships on a one-day special are gone. What we have to understand in our marketing message and a trend that I think we will start to see, I don't know whether we will or not, but I'd like to see it, is that we start to think about our marketing plan or our strategy over three, six or 12 months. And we start to embrace the word eventually eventually we will get this person as a member. We may not get them today, but we may get them further down the track. Um, and I think that's a key thing for us around our marketing. I also believe, and, and anyone that kind of sees some of the stuff that I put out, I've got a little formula around marketing as well. Could I share that? We would love you to share that. It's my KLTB formula. So in our marketing, KLTB stands for we need our prospects or our community to know us then we need to like they need to like us then they need to trust us and then they will buy from us and too many fitness businesses tr what i'm seeing too many are going from know us to buy from us which means they're not buying we're actually selling to them so that's going to have an impact on long-term retention member loyalty referrals usage and makes hard work for us so if we just think about the formula, know, like, trust, and buy, KLTB, then that's going to help us be more successful in our marketing. That's a great formula to remember. And you mentioned right at the very beginning of this segment, JT, that you uh, have observed, and I know a social media examiner, as you mentioned, uh, have come out saying that people are moving away from Facebook and putting more attention to Instagram. And for anyone who has their audience on that platform and they want to utilise that platform more, I should just mention that we do have the Instagram expert, Tyler J. McCall, coming up on the Fitness Business Podcast later on this month. And interestingly enough, based on what you were just saying, one of the things that he talks about is how important it is that we use that platform, if we're using that platform, to nurture our relationships before they move to that buying stage. So that no like trust that you were just talking about is exactly the strategy that he follows for um, Instagram as well, Instagram marketing. So just interesting. And if anyone wants to check out that show with Tyler J. McCall, maybe just write Instagram. Uh, in the comments as you're watching this and as soon as that episode comes out then we'll shoot you through a direct link okay so that is segment number one it is marketing let's move on to number two which is sales what are you seeing as far as trends and predictions go in the area of sales jt i think the industry is totally confused between being a retail sales model and a personal sales model and i think this is because of the rise of boutiques 
the rise of fitness studios, they kind of launched the retail sales model in our industry. But in all reality, big box clubs, it's not a retail sales model, it's got to be a personal sales model. So I think there's a, there's a lot of confusion happening between those two sales strategies or sales processes the clubs are putting in. And they, they need to first determine are they going to be a retail-based model or are they going to be a personal sales-based model? Okay, so what you're saying is we need to think about this up front. Is there, do you have any advice for people as to how they can go about working out which one of those models they should be? Shit, yeah. It's pretty Give simple. It if you're a box club or you're a personal trainer, you can't do retail sales. You've got to do a personal-based sale. And so one of the trends that I definitely see is clubs and, for that matter, individual salespeople are becoming freaking lazy. So what I believe is this, is that if I use the metaphor, a baseball metaphor, which Americans will get, everyone around the world will get, is that if I come up to the home plate and I get a pitch and I hit that pitch and the ball goes out of the park, it goes into the bleachers, into the grandstand, that's an automatic home run. But the rules of baseball still say I have to run to first base, touch first base, run to second base, touch second base, third touch, home touch. I can't just run to third base and back. And so what salespeople are doing is they're forgetting about the basics of sales. They're forgetting about building a relationship with people and they're just going, oh, you want to have a look around? Sure, and they're talking on the run. It's very much a feature-based tour. It's very much, I, I understand you're time poor. No one is time poor in the world when they want to buy something. They're time poor when they are going to be sold something. So if I sit down with someone and spend time with them, getting to know them, then that's going to help us convert at a higher rate and we're going to have that person not just like us, they're going to trust us and therefore they're going to buy from us. So I think one of the trends that I'm seeing in our industry is that we're reducing the amount of time that's spent on a needs analysis. I also believe that we are not training our salespeople well enough in basic communication skills. What we're doing is training them in scripts and scripts simply suck. But they're the most important thing when we've got a brand new person because they don't know what to say. So we've got to script them up so that they understand what we're saying and why we're saying it. But as quickly as possible, we have to teach them to communicate and we have to teach them to have a conversation with every single person that's coming in. And I think that's what I'm seeing from a sales perspective is the lack of conversations. It's so scripted, it's so spilled, that, pe that we're going to third base and back in order to close a sale. Whereas if we spent more time with a prospect and we converse more with them, we show that we care, they then move from the like bit to the trust bit. And when they then trust us, they're going to buy from us. That's the process that I think we need to go back to. I'm probably preaching to a lot of people who already get it. But I can assure you that in our business, we do a lot of mystery shopping in clubs. It's one of the services we offer. And when I read the feedback that we get from those mystery shops, the amount of time that is being spent in a needs analysis is absolutely decreasing. And the amount of time that in a, in a needs analysis, when we have a good needs analysis, correlates with a positive tour. Okay, so for anyone that is watching this on Facebook, watch live with us, or if you're watching them in replay, if you've got anything to add to what JT has just gone through, any comments, any feedback of how things operate in your club, then now is a great time for you to jump on and leave us a comment below. Or if you've got any questions for JT around the area of sales, then make sure that you comment below right now. Okay, we're going to move on to topic number three, JT, which is an area that I know you are really passionate and very experienced about, and that is managing teams. So tell us your thoughts on trends around managing teams. Yeah, okay. So what we've seen across the world is an absolute growth of chains and franchises. I think in Australia now, the other day I did a quick count, there's probably 15 to 20 different franchises just in Australia. 
who knows how many there are in the US. So what we're seeing around looking after our people that work for us is a lot of owners and a lot of managers are managing by remote. So what we're seeing from a trend-wise perspective is certainly an increase in the use of systems in order to manage teams and projects from a distance. So I know that a lot of guests that come on the show uh, talk about Slack. Uh, so I hear a lot of people using Slack, Asana. Some people are now using uh, Workplace Facebook uh, because apparently it's free. So there's lots of different apps out there but we're seeing a lot of people use that to be able to manage projects and manage people by remote. Uh, we're seeing obviously the use of technology, using things like Zoom, like we're using today, and Skype in order to Skype people in or Zoom people in for meetings. I even know that there are some uh, industry consultants that are doing sales training and um, customer service training via Zoom as well, enabling us to get all around the world. Um, but I also think you know, the other trend that I'm seeing about uh, managing by remote these our teams that are so diverse is that there's a lot of hope involved. Uh, and hope, of course, is not a strategy. So if you are hoping that people will get things done or hoping that they can uh, achieve the goals or the targets that you're setting, that ain't going to work. You still have to manage people. And so what I also see is a trend, if it, perhaps even a negative trend, is in fact the lack of love owners and managers, department managers are giving to their teams. So Simon Sinek, one of my favourite quotes from Simon Sinek in his book, Leaders Eat Last, says, you cannot replace time with the boss with money. So in other words, I can't pay you more money to replace sitting down and having a cup of coffee with the department manager or the owner of the business. And I think as owners of the business or managers, we have to understand that just like our kids look up to us and want to be just like us, our staff probably do as well. So what we need to do is we need to spend time with our team. We need to really get in and get dirty. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, get in and get dirty in the trenches with our team so that we really know who they are as people, what pushes their buttons, what makes them happy, what they're looking for in their life, as well as uh, from a personal satisfaction perspective. And one of the best resources that I would recommend is the 12 questions in uh, the book, First Break All the Rules. People need to look at that. They need to be asking those questions to their team. The top seven of those questions need to be asked every single week. And those questions need to be asked every single quarter to their team. Well, we will grab a link to that book and put it just below in the comments. So for those of you that do want to check it out, you can check out those 12 questions. And I might also add to that, JT, as you know, we had Dory Nugent on the show uh, just two weeks ago and Dory spoke exactly about what you're talking about. That is taking the time out to get to know your team, taking them out of the gym environment, sitting down and hearing about what's going on with their family, what's happening in their lives and just um, paying that genuine and engaged interest in our team members. And it's like it's, it's going back to the fundamentals of getting to know someone, but it is such a valuable uh, connection tool that you can have with your, uh, with your employees. If people want those 12 questions, if they put 12, and they don't want to read the book, <laughs> if they put 12 questions in the comments below, just put all one, two, Q or 12 quest or whatever it may be, Put it in the comments below and I'll send the questions to you. Okay, you've got a deal. So we'll put the, we'll put the book link. I'm also going to link Dory's show and uh, let's just make it easy and just put the word questions. We'll make it super easy. Pop it in the, pop it in the comments and uh, JT will send that out to you. Okay, moving on to our next. No, I got oh. one more thing. Okay, hold the phone. So this, is about, this is about people and this is a phrase that I am using and using a lot with club owners and club managers. It's this. If you give a shit about your staff, then give a shit about your staff. That's very Australian, I know. But if you, if you actually care about your staff, then care about your staff. Nice translation, by the way. That was very Aussie, <laughs> but I think we all get the idea. Okay, so on to our next topic now, JT, and I'm going to give you the choice. Nice, uh, nice coffee mug with water in it, by the way. Um, Customers, uh, let me try that again. I'm going to give you the choice. Retention, customer service, 
or you can do a little bit of both. Over to you. So first of all, we're seeing um, technology starting to increase around this retention side of things. Um, just recently, I've seen keepit.ai, the retention people, coach AI. We've seen MyZone bring out some, obviously great supporters of the show, MyZone, bring out some great data around uh, usage and retention based on people who are using clubs. So I definitely see that technology is absolutely helping us identify members at risk and enabling us to create engagement with, back with our members. However, the trend that I'm also seeing is that with margins being so tight in our businesses these days, we are getting rid of the greatest asset to our business, and that's people. So we can have technology to identify an at-risk member, but we still need a person to talk to that at-risk member. We still need to have people in our business because we can't expect any stickiness, and I know that's a kind of gross word, but for me, stickiness to, with our brand if people are not involved. So the trend that I see is that we want to improve retention, we want to improve customer service, but at the same time, we want to reduce our wages. And they just don't mix. You can't do both. And if you do, I want to hear about your business model because I'd love to know how you do it. Now, I do know, obviously, you can reduce the price so low, like Planet Fitness, for example, in the US. They've got a low price. People are going to stay based on price. But the most important thing for me is if you're a high yielding club, in other words, you're charging good dollars, you can't get rid of the people if you want to improve retention and you want to improve customer service. So that's, that's my big point, I guess, around this, is it's about creating that stickiness with people. I've also seen as a trend, and again, I think this has been driven pretty heavily by the fitness boutiques, and that's about creating experiences. And obviously, this is something very close to my heart because I believe this is a key to retention. I believe this is a key to actually getting more people into our clubs and getting people to move more often. And that is about creating experiences. And often we think about those experiences are only offline, but we need to start embracing the idea of online experiences and offline experiences. So there's technology that can help us online and there's people that can help us offline. Um, but I think as a, as a whole, the industry is playing catch up to the fitness boutiques around creating experiences. So for me, we need to go back to the drawing board and really say, okay, when somebody gets in our parking lot or our car park, that's when the experience may or may not begin for them in a face-to-face. -face. Let's go all the way through their workout to when they finish. Let's look at those friction points, the things that are going to slow down or inhibit their experience, and let's get rid of them. That's, the, that's really what we need to be doing. And I'm just starting to see some clubs embrace that thought process but there's a hell of a lot that still need to and i know that you and i have covered this topic before and and it's always a good reminder i think when we're talking about experience and customer experience is to really think about whether or not the digital experience that they have with us and you mentioned the boutique studios whether or not that digital experience they have from the moment that they're checking out our website or um, booking in for a class or booking in for a, um, a walkthrough whatever it might be is actually matching the experience that they get when they roll up to the car park when they walk in the door when they go to the smoothie bar so uh, i love that you've mentioned how important it is to think about both the online and the offline experience for our members um, that's why you pay me the big bucks. That's right. That's right. That's why we got you on as the uh, the June guest on Talking Trends. Okay, JT, let's keep moving on. Now, I would have to say that I think you have probably visited more gyms across the world and done more classes than most people have ever done. And that's pretty perfect considering we're just about to talk about fitness programming. So what are you thinking? What are you seeing when it comes to trends around fitness programming? I'm why. Like bucket load of notes here that I've got. <laughs> I've actually written down, um, I am not really, this is not really my area of expertise. <laughs> so completely opposite to what I have just said. But well, you're an area from a consumer point of view. 
I agree that I go out and work out in a lot of clubs and, and, and experience lots of different exercise programming sides of things. But I can't tell you whether um, there's a trend going to back to three sets of 10 or isolated strength training or anything like that. But there's a couple of observations that I can make. How does that sound? Okay, I'm up for that. How about you give us some observations around fitness programming? Okay, so the first thing that I'm seeing is that big box clubs are not nailing small group training. You know, generally clubs are struggling with that. They're, tr they're almost adding it as an adjunct into their product. Some clubs are offering it for free, which pisses off the personal trainers. Some of them are, off are offering it for free and therefore it's inhibiting their group training, um, uh, their what do you call it? Group fitness classes? Group fitness class, yeah. Your group fitness classes. So the clubs that I see that are doing really well with small group training are developing a brand within a brand. So some clubs are obviously using, um, again, a great sponsor of the podcast, Tribe Team Training. They're using that. Some are coming up with their own. But it's a brand within a brand. That's when it's being successful. And sometimes it's actually setting up a... Um, like a studio or a separate area inside the club that relates specifically to small group training. So I think this is an important aspect that if we want to build this as part of our product offering, we've got to start to think as this is a brand or this is another profit center, not a cost center, and it's not a retention program. It's a profit center inside our business. And we start to, we need to put a champion who's going to drive it. We need a marketing plan. We need a strategy behind getting that. And I just don't see a lot of clubs actually doing that. This is really important because for anyone that's watching at the moment that um, has gone through the process of trying to get uh, small group training, small team training up and running, has been unsuccessful, perhaps you've done it internally. Um, last year, JT, you'll probably remember, I actually did a show with Sue Richards from Tribe, who you just mentioned is a partner of the show. And what I loved about that particular show is she took us through a step-by-step -step guide of how you can actually implement profitable small group training into your club. So if anyone uh, is interested in checking that out, perhaps just write small group training or SGT in the comments below uh, and I'll post a link for that interview because it is such an easy to follow uh, guide from an expert in this area. And uh, if you're interested, just pop that in the comments. Back to you, JT. Um, I'm also seeing within clubs around personal training that there's still a struggle between do I go with an employee model or do I go with a contractor model? So clubs aren't really sure when they've got the contractor model, of course, they have no control over them. Contractor being defined as they're paying rent as opposed to employee where they're paid a wage. So I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of clubs now going back to employed personal trainers because that gives them a little bit better quality control of the service of the product. Um, and I, I, I got to admit, if I was running a club, that's the way I would be running it. But there's no question that the, the, across the globe, the message that I hear is that there are no good personal trainers out there. And when I ask, what do you mean by no good personal trainers? The answer that I get back comes back to their communication skills. They're good at training people technically sound but communicating with people is their weakness so i think as a as an industry that's an area that we need to push back on uh the providers of education and say hey look you're producing great technical trainers but we ne still need to improve their communication skills uh so that they can continue to grow their business so whether they're a contractor or an employee i'm hearing exactly the same thing people these new trainers that are coming out are weak as water around their communication skills. I'm seeing virtual classes take off at glacial speed. It, they're not, they're, they haven't come out of the blocks like Ben Johnson did in the 80s. Now, admittedly, that was drug-infused, but we haven't seen virtual come out fast. And I thought it might have been a quicker uptake from both consumers and clubs, but it hasn't come out as quickly as we probably would have thought it might have been. Nevertheless, 
We have seen, obviously, the boom of Peloton, and that's now becoming a, comp a competing business with a lot of bricks and mortar clubs. But we're seeing, and this is, I think, is the most exciting thing for me, is that there are more streaming products that are coming up. So I imagine, and my prediction of the future is that a club will be streaming their classes straight into people's lounge rooms at five o'clock in the afternoon. So instead of doing body pump in the in your class, but they'll also be doing it at home. So I think streaming is going to have an impact over the next couple of years. In fact, I think um, now whether streaming is defined as virtual, I don't know. Maybe it is, uh, but I my thought process is that I think streaming will surpass the virtual class potentially, potentially. I just want to say for anyone that isn't familiar with the topic of um, streaming group fitness classes, if you want to know more, then I'm going to put a link uh, in, our, uh, in our comments below to an interview that I did with Lauren Fundos from Forte who uh, has absolutely forged some, some great ground when it comes to live streaming, live streaming, live streaming your fitness classes to members. So I'll put that link uh, in the comments below. And then the last one, obviously, from around exercise programming is that the proliferation of challenges. So what we're seeing is every club is running a transformation challenge. It's a six week, it's an eight week, it's a 12 week challenge, 12 I'm generally seeing it's too long. I'm seeing a sweet spot of somewhere between six and eight weeks, um, an occasional four-week challenge. Uh, the four-week challenge is probably more uh, specific, like it might be a no-sugar four-week challenge or no-alcohol challenge for four weeks or a sleep-better challenge for four weeks, uh, whereas the six to eight weeks is far more like a transformation-type challenge. Where I'm seeing that a lot. Um, I'm loving, and again, another plug, I guess, for... Um, one of our podcast partners, MyZone. MyZone's uh, challenges that, that, that they have within the platform make life so much easier for a club owner. So the club owners like Troy Morgan in Willows here in Australia, um, I think Ryan Voigt over there in the US, um, and obviously there's plenty of others, and, and MyZone will be able to tell us all of them, uh, who are using the challenge platform within MyZone are seeing great results. The thing with the MyZone challenges is that you can determine who gets the who gets MEPS points based on what level that they work at. So if you don't want people in the red zone, we get we don't count points. So it could be a low intensity challenge where they only get points, say, in the green zone. Now I'm not an expert at all in my zone and my zone challenges, and I'm not here to try to sell the product. But I love the concept that we can then run these programs in our club. They're already pre-done and challenges for me is a great way to create stickiness and ways to engage with our members. Well, I've got to say, for someone who's not an expert in the area of fitness program, you did pretty good to explain all of that to us, JT. Thank you. Okay, we are moving on to the final section of Talking Trends for today, an area that I am very passionate about, and I know that you are too, and that is professional development. So share with us your thoughts around trends and predictions for professional development. First of all, if I, if I could tell you about predictions, I would probably be running a conference and making a, a shed load of money out of it. Um, but here's what I do know is that I'm seeing lots of what I'm going to call micro-conferences and micro-events. So these are events that are popping up all over the world that are low cost, one day, and uber general. Like, I believe that's the weakness, by the way. They're just... I think what's happened is people have gone, oh, there's lots of gyms, there's lots of fitness businesses let's run an education or a professional development event. And so what they run from a, and I'm only talking from a business side of things. I'm not talking about technical side of things. So they're very, very general in some of their topics. So what I think if I was going to predict something in the future, then I think we're going to start to see more niche like conferences. It's things that are not necessarily specific around a category of business, not like a, an event, which is, which we, we do see, um, fitness studios or PT studios or big box gyms. Yes, we're seeing that now. But I actually think we'll start to see ones that are specifically around sales. Obviously, in the US, they've got the Motion Soft Technology Summit. 
Um, we have the Fitness Industry Technology Summit here in Australia. So some really niche ones, we're going to see that. But I think in general, we, people, I just think there are people out there that believe with all of these different brands and opportunities that are out there, that there is a, a golden goose that's laying a, an egg with a full of money around running uh, events. And I think that bubble is going to burst because I just don't think it's going to last. And here's the reason why I don't think it's going to last is because many brands themselves are now running their own events. So anytime fitness have their own international conference, they have their own conference in Australia. Vision Personal Training, and I know you've had Andrew Simmons on the show, they have their own conference. We see that Good Life in Canada have their own conference. 24-Hour Fitness have their own conference. Uh, Energy in the UK, and I know we've had uh, Jan Spateri on the show. We basically have these big brands. Why do they need to send people to a generic event when they can reinforce their culture, their core values, and what they're trying to do by running their own event. So I think we're going to start to see that more and more often. Um, I think that that kind of makes sense. Um, we've ob- obviously seen, and I'll, I'll just say this and then you'll take over, I'm sure, um, <laughs> is that we've seen obvious growth around professional development using audio books and podcasts. Insert plug now. I think I... I Obviously, I'm going to agree with that. And we have certainly seen a massive increase in growth over the last, I would say, 12 months, more than ever before, of people starting to consume podcasts in particular. Uh, As you know, JT, I'm a huge fan of audio medium and and listening to professional development on Audible. Uh, But I think that people are definitely starting to discover the benefits of where um, audio books and podcasts can fit into what is quite often these days a really busy lifestyle as of this week we are gonna see freaking mass media jump on podcasts with the changes that apple have made talk us through that so just this week apple developers at their conference uh so this week's the first week of june Mm -hmm. um have just announced they're getting rid of itunes Mm. closing the itunes store down and they're gonna re basically pump up podcasting so this is going to be a massive hit for obviously our show or your show the show um in the industry but also we're going to see podcasts i think increase as a medium for education let's hope that we do do that because uh we have certainly been through a journey over the last four years of uh you know starting off with a platform that was relatively unknown uh four years ago there was very little happening around this area and i think that anyone that is a consumer of the podcast medium um, regardless of what show you listen to uh, they truly understand the benefits of what it can bring to uh to you personally uh, but also a lot of people i think are starting to share that material with their teams and with their colleagues and um and right across the board so it's definitely uh becoming a very advantageous media to be part of yeah just on podcasting Mm. i am seeing a lot of fitness businesses um start to have their own podcast Mm -hmm. that's a great marketing tool because that's getting people to know us like us and because of the content that we deliver trust us and therefore they buy from us so it's great that fitness businesses are doing that But they have to understand that the success of a podcast, which you can attest to, is being consistent with that podcast. So if you're going to produce a podcast to help market your business to the consumer, to get more people into your fitness um, business, your studio, your club, your um, PT business, you have to deliver a consistent podcast. And it's a lot of bloody hard work. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, Yeah, I can attest to that. So, I mean, for us to be able to put a show together every single week takes a lot of time, a lot of energy. And in order for podcasting to be successful as a marketing strategy, you've got to understand how much time that will take. So don't overpromise. It might mean you just do a podcast once a month. And that could be enough to help generate some leads because people get to like, know, trust, and therefore buy from you. Okay. A couple of other quick things on personal development. Um, I actually think that a lot of club owners 
uh, and managers are skimping on their investment around professional development. I think they're, they, they're skimping on the money that they want to spend and they're, they're skimping on the time that they want to put into professional development. And again, this is because our margins might be tight or we're just not putting that extra effort into professional development. So um, the reality is we have to invest. This is a key word. We have to invest in our team if they're going to get better. So we have to see that every piece of professional development, whether it's half an hour listening to a podcast, an hour um, doing some reading together of a, of a document or an ebook, that's an investment in making them better. So that's a key point. We have to understand that we're investing in our team. Final thing that I want to say around it is this. Regardless of what's going on in the world with technology, you cannot be face-to-face -face education. You cannot be sitting down in a classroom or a meeting room um, and being skin-to-skin, -skin, face to face belly-to-belly -belly with other people as well as the presenter and the speaker. So I think the best results that you will ever get from professional development is going to come from face-to-face. -face. So we should always build in to our budget. There's an interesting word for many club owners. Budget is in the professional development budget. We must include getting to conferences. There's a lot of people saying, oh, we don't need to go. We can get that information online. Yes, you can, but you cannot be sitting down with somebody and having a conversation with them at lunchtime or after the event or even being able to ask questions right there at that event. Okay, JT, so thank you for taking us through such an in-depth look at all of those six different areas around the business of fitness. Now, one of the things that you did touch on briefly then was the Fitness Industry Technology Summit. So for anyone that hasn't heard about the event, can you give us a bit of an insight as to what's happening, when it is, where it's being held and why people should come along? But for those that are watching uh, who are in the US, I will be at uh, the Athletic Business Show. So if you want to come and catch up, catch up at the Athletic Business Show, which I'm pretty sure is November. Mm, November. It, yeah, it's in November. So catch up with me there if you're in the US. Uh, but in Australia, New Zealand or Asia, Get your butts to Sydney on the 25th and 26th of July for the Fitness Industry Technology Summit. And I've got to give credit to Motionsoft again in the US. We went there last year. And when we went to that event and we were the media partners for that event, I saw exactly the power that, that the average gym owner can get from technology. I saw, thanks to Motionsoft, the power that people walked away from people walked away from that event empowered to really transform their business around technology. And as we didn't have anything like that in Australia, and Motionsoft don't exist in Australia, that's what got me to thinking, can we in fact improve the efficiencies, the effectiveness, the productivity, and therefore the profitability of businesses in Australia around using technology? And that's exactly what we put together. So we put together a day and a, a night um, we have a very special dinner on the Thursday night, which is Christmas in July dinner. We have a keynote speaker there who's coming from Facebook to speak about the platform. Uh, she's a senior partner there at Facebook, uh, client partner. The event is really designed for decision makers in the business. It's really for owners. It's really for um, uh, marketing managers. The average front desk person is not going to get any value out of this. So this is for decision makers in the business that want to learn to embrace technology. And we're looking at how do we improve, like I said, the efficiencies, the effectiveness and the productivity of our business, all leading to increased profitability. Uh, I'm really excited because I think we've got 17 speakers of which I want to say uh, 11 of them are from outside the industry. They're experts in technology. So you need to check out fitnessindustrytechsummit.com.au uh, and get along. And if you are a Fitness Business Podcast family member, FBP family, if you use the word active, you'll save 100 bucks on Rego. We love a good deal, JT. And for anyone that missed 
that website will make sure that we pop it uh, just down below so you can check it out. Or of course, you can write fits in the comments of this broadcast and we will make sure that we give you the link for the Fitness Industry Technology Summit. So JT, it has been great catching up. I've really enjoyed our chat today. Thank you for sharing your insights with all of us. And, uh, and thank you for joining us for the June edition of Talking Trends. My pleasure. Great being here. Thank you for having me.